town dated back to the Hopewell period and was, they think it was built around 400 AD. It measured uh, 51 feet in diameter and was five and a half feet tall. Now, it was much larger, but over the years, between weather and everything, it, it wore down. But um, it was excavated on October 5th, 1895 by the Carnegie Museum. They dug two trenches across the mound to a depth of six to 12 feet below ground level. They found human skulls, arrowheads, hammers, a fishing sinker, human and animal bones. They also said that the mound was surrounded by six large oak trees that were said to be part of the original forest growth here that were never cut down. Now this picture was taken in 1895 during the excavation. And you can see there are some large trees that surround the mound. Um, they took uh, what they found down to the Carnegie Museum. The only problem was back then a lot of the local children and people who lived in the area would go down there and dig through it. So it had been damaged by people who just went through and, and, and dug things out and took them home. Now, this is a map, and it's sort of hard to see, but it gives you an idea of where it was located. Here's the Allegheny River, here's the mouth of Plum Creek, and here it is right here. Um, they designated it as Site 83, so it is recognized as a significant archaeological site. Today, it's part of the River's Edge development at Edgewater. This is what it looks like today. Um, when I took that picture, I was standing on the spot looking towards the river. And from what I can tell from the plans of River's Edge, that looks like it's going to be a green space. So it doesn't look like uh, anything will be built on it. However, over the years, um, the area was filled in uh, by Edgewater when they had the factory. They filled that area in and brought it up. I think they built it up about 12 feet. So that is not the original elevation where it was. The other mound was what they called the Anderson Mound. It was named the Anderson Mound because it was on the Anderson property. And it was located on Avenue. This mound was excavated in June of 1964 as part of the Oakmont 75th uh, celebra anniversary celebration. If you know Betty Rayfield, you may remember her. Uh, I guess somehow she found out about it. She contacted the Carnegie Museum, and they sent out an archaeologist, and together with the Girl Scouts, they excavated the mound. This mound was 38 feet in circumference. However, it was only 12 inches high. And one of the reasons, it was a lot older than the, the Oakmont Mound. This one dated back to 1000 B.C. Uh, when they excavated it, they found um, a spear thrower. It was some type of, almost like a boomerang type of thing. They found two pipes, what they called a bolo stone, a pottery, arrowheads, and copper beads. Now what's significant with the copper beads is, at that time, there was no copper in this area. So, archaeologists believed that whoever lived here traded with Native Americans who lived in the upper Midwest because that's where they found the copper. So there had to be travel between the, the Ameri Native Americans of this area and the upper Midwest. The other thing of significance is um, whoever was buried there must have been someone of importance because of those beads because they were very rare here and so it leads you to believe it may have been an Indian chief or somebody like that buried there because those copper beads were buried with it. Um, I contacted the um, Carnegie because I, I had heard that after they excavated it, a lot of those artifacts were on display here in Oakmont. And so I called to see if we could possibly have them back and display them here. Uh, the lady told me that they're doing re renovations down there and they're in storage and they won't be available for another two years. But she did send some pictures out. And these are some pictures that were taken while they were excavating. 
the gentleman who led the excavation was a man by the name of Dick George. And he said that as soon as he started digging, he saw these stones. And he could tell these stones were not natural in that area. They were river stones that were put in place there. So that's when he knew that it was, in fact, a burial mound. This is another shot looking towards Washington Avenue and 2nd Street would be over on the right side of the screen. And this is just another shot. Uh, this gives you a good picture of, of the stones, how they were placed in the mound there. You can see them all in that one section. And that's just another um, shot of the excavation. Um, I guess times were different back then because uh, it was dug up and they built an apartment building on there. Yes? What was the date of this excavation? June of 1964. So those were our other two burial grounds that, that were located here in Oakmont. The next one we talk about is the Bright Cemetery, and I'm sure you're all aware of the Bright Cemetery. It's located on 4th Street between Pennsylvania and Maryland Avenues. This cemetery is nearly 200 years old. It was established in 1823 by Michael Bright. Michael Bright was the original settler who came here in 1816. His wife, Barbara, passed away in 1823. And when she did, he took a portion of his land and set it aside as a burial ground. Now, the original cemetery was much larger than it is today. Uh, they said that it went from the other side of 4th Street down to around where the boulevard is today. It was almost three times as big as what it is. In 1858, Peter Bright, who was Michael Bright's son, he sold a portion of the cemetery to the Valley United Presbyterian Church. And they built a church on that portion of the cemetery. That church is still standing. That Today we know it as the American Legion over on Isabella Street. That was the first uh, Presbyterian church here. In 1901, they built the building at 5th and um, Pennsylvania and moved up there. Uh, so that's probably one of the oldest buildings here in Oakmont. In 1871, the borough of Verona was incorporated. And at the time, we all know, Oakmont was what was considered the second ward of Verona. So the following year, in 1872, when the officials in Verona laid out the street plans, uh, what would be 4th Street was planned to go through the eastern side of the cemetery. Now, there was a law passed back in 1838 by the Pennsylvania legislature that said uh, municipalities, towns, cities could not just wantonly dis uh, dig up cemeteries. If they were going to expand through a cemetery, they had to make proper arrangements to rebury the bodies that were in there. Well, the officials in Verona either weren't aware of that law or they ignored it. And they sent their construction workers to complete 4th Street through that cemetery. Well, Michael Bright had three granddaughters. Elizabeth, Rachel, and Mary Jane Bright. And they were very proud of their family. This is an a old photograph of them, and it looks like somebody tried to sketch their faces back in, but that's the three sisters. Well, anyways, when the construction workers showed up to build the street, these three showed up with their shotguns. <laughs> and uh, they told any of the construction workers, if you step foot in the cemetery, you may end up in the cemetery. <laughs> So <laughs> completion of 4th Street was halted. And for a number of years, 4th Street ended at each side of the cemetery. That started a dispute between the Bright family and the borough. Lawsuits were filed on both sides. And for the next 25 years, uh, there was a standoff between the borough and the Bright family. The family claimed that where they wanted to put the street, there were between 50 and 75 people buried in that section. They claimed that there were almost 150 people buried in that cemetery 
Now, we have an inventory that I think shows about 38. So we don't know. You know, back then they didn't keep records, but um, that's, that's uh, the problem that developed. Well, finally, in 1897, an agreement was reached between Oakmont and the Bright family. The borough was granted a 35-foot right-of-way through the cemetery to complete 4th Street. For that, they would pay the Bright family $500. They would pay the cost to have all the bodies removed and reburied. They would build a stone wall facing 4th Street. They would agree to place an ornamental fence on that wall and surround the cemetery. They also said that they would have borough workers clean the cemetery twice a year, uh, twice a year, clearing the brush and cutting down the weeds and cutting the grass. And they also agreed to install a slate sidewalk in front of the cemetery. And what's interesting is, of course, the stone wall is still there, but that's the original slate sidewalk that's um, in front of the cemetery. That's never been replaced with concrete. One of the reasons I think they finally reached an agreement, the mayor at the time was a man by the name of Albert McGee. And Albert was married to Mary Ann Bright. She was the great granddaughter of Michael Bright and she was a member of the Bright family. And it's because of his connection to the Bright family with his wife that they were finally able to work out an agreement and settle the dispute. The Bright family was very protective of that cemetery. However, uh, by the 1920s, most of them were gone. So uh, in 1926, some of the surviving members of the Bright family uh, approached Oakmont Borough Council, and they offered to donate the cemetery to the borough and turn it into a park. And they said what they would do is remove all the headstones, leave all the bodies interred, and make it into a, like a nature preserve park. However, the borough said, no thanks, we don't want to have to take care of it. So uh, they uh, let it go. Unfortunately, for a number of years, uh, it passed between caretakers. There were no official caretakers. Um, when the American Legion moved in, they took care of it for a while. Uh, the Oakmont Boy Scouts took care of it for a while. Uh, it's just sort of been hanging out there. Right now, a gentleman who lives across the street, Nat Mastro, has been taking care of it and keeping it cleaned and making sure that there's no vandalism in there. And you know, it's, it's been in good shape the past few years. I don't know if you've been by there. But um, there's really been no structure to take care of that cemetery. In 1889, uh, as part of the Oakmont Centennial, the borough did recognize the significance of it, and they placed this monument uh, in the cemetery. This is located right in the front above the, um, the wall. As I said, records confirm the burial of 32 bodies in the cemetery. Uh, although I said the Bright family claimed there are over 150 people buried there. Um, Michael Bright and his descendants are buried there. However, um, there are a lot of other people buried there, names that have no connection to the Bright family. So people from the area were buried in that cemetery. There are also four Civil War soldiers who are buried in that cemetery. Uh, you may have seen the stones for Adam Bright, Charles Bright, Joseph Wood, Emmanuel Gruber, William Dugan and Charles uh, George Conklin. They all died, uh, they're all Civil War veterans and are buried there. Now, I told you there were four, but I gave you six names because two of them, the monuments, there's monuments for two that aren't buried there. The first is uh, Adam Bright. Adam Bright was the son of Peter and Margaret Bright. He was captured during the Civil War and he was taken to Andersonville Prison in Georgia where he died. After the war, uh, the Bright family tried to have his remains returned for burial here, although they couldn't locate him in the cemetery there, so they weren't able to bring him back. 
But what the family did is they had this monument erected with his name and his information on there so he would not be forgotten. And the, uh, the bronze markers are there next to the stone that has his name on it. And his brother Charles is buried in this, this one here. So we do have the memory of Adam Bright. The other one is an interesting story. This was George Conklin. And you can see by his headstone, it says George Conklin, soldier, 61 through 65. So he was in the war for the long haul, 61 to 65. Uh, what's interesting is the story goes, when he passed away, they think he died of smallpox. And so they didn't want to bury him in the town. So they took him and they buried him above Plum Creek, over where Penn Hills Park is, across from uh, Dark Hollow Woods. And that's where he was buried. About 20 years ago, I guess some kids were out there hiking around, and they found the stone, which had slidden down the hill. And so they came back and started telling the story. Well, a gentleman by the name of Dan Hamilton, and Dan's right there in the yellow shirt, he heard about it. And Dan and his son and the Boy Scouts went out and looked for the stone, and they found it. And so they brought it back and uh, asked if it would be okay to put it in the Bright Cemetery, which they did. And there's the stone in the cemetery. And as a result of their efforts, George Conklin is not forgotten. So it was a, a nice uh, deed that they did to remember that soldier. As far as we know, but the stone was over the hill, right? So they don't know exactly where he was buried. It's just up there somewhere. So yeah, his, his remains are still there. It was always thought that the Bright Cemetery was a family cemetery. However, after researching the Verona Cemetery, um, it's likely that the Bright Cemetery was a, a cemetery for profit where they sold lots. So that's the story of the Bright Cemetery, and that now takes us to the Verona Cemetery. And so you say, where is the Verona Cemetery located? It's located in Oakmont. That only makes sense. Why is it located in Oakmont? Well, the cemetery was incorporated in 1882, seven years before the borough of Oakmont was incorporated. So as a result, when it was formed, it was actually in Verona's second ward. Now, just like the cemetery, as I said on 4th Street, the Verona Cemetery can credit its formation to the Bright family. Throughout the 1800s, Peter Bright, who was the son of Michael Bright, acquired a lot of land around the original Bright uh, family farm. As a result, through the 1800s, he became one of the largest landowners here in Oakmont. And when he died, his land was passed on to his children. It was divided up amongst his children. Well, he had uh, three daughters, Rachel, Mary Jane, and Celinda. And they received property. And this is an old map. And you can see, uh, here's Bright family. Then we have another Bright family here. And then we have Mrs. Anderson, who is Celinda. She married uh, William Anderson. So she had the property from Pennsylvania Avenue, 10th Street, Maryland, up to 11th Street. And that was the property that she had uh, inherited from her father. So she decided that she would take a portion of her land and she would start to sell off plots for burials to her friends. And the original cemetery is located right here. And this is Maryland. This is 11th Street, Pennsylvania Avenue. And the border here is what's called Juniper Alley. The alley was never completed in that block. And then this is 10th Street here between Pennsylvania and Maryland. So she offered plots for sale beginning in 1880. In 1881, she hired a surveying company of Edaburn Cooper to serve the land and lay out burial plots. And there's the original boundaries of the Verona Cemetery. 
Shortly afterwards, Celinda and her husband William approached the borough of uh, Verona with the idea of a public cemetery. So her and her husband, along with 35 residents, petitioned the Court of Common Pleas to form a cemetery, and on January 3rd, 1882, the Verona Cemetery Corporation was granted. Now, it was agreed that plot sales uh, would go directly back to William and Solyndra until they received $3,000. This was compensation for the land that they gave for the cemetery. Once they received their $3,000, all the other money in excess of that would go to the cemetery corporation for improvement and upkeep of the cemetery. Harry S. Paul was uh, elected first president of the, secretary, of the uh, cemetery. Uh, William Hotline was the secretary. Celinda's husband, William, was the treasurer and William Anderson was also named the superintendent. The first directors included Thomas Westerman, Harry Armstrong, Charles Reinhardt, and S.B. Clement. William Hotline was placed in charge of selling the burial plots, and it was agreed that he would receive a 6% commission on all the plots that he sold. William and Celinda, Celinda took care of the everyday operation of the cemetery. Well, the following year, they released their first annual report in January of 1883, and it reported $2,200 in sales, less $132 paid to Mr. Hotline. Now, Solyndra died on March 11th, 1899. After she died, her husband continued to run the cemetery. In 1896, they hired the first sexton, a man by the name of William Dougherty, and Anderson paid his salary and any expenses that were related to the cemetery. In 1901, they had the cemetery resurveyed and laid out again because the original survey was lost. And Mr. Hodline continued to sell plots up through 1905. Well, in 1905, uh, Solyndra's daughter and son, for some reason, they thought they had to, a right to sell off the cemetery. And they sold a portion of the cemetery to a gentleman by the name of Tom McCandless. Now, this parcel was located on D Street, which is now Maryland Avenue. And it was down on Maryland Avenue. And it extended back from the street 180 feet. They sold it to Mr. McCandless, and then three weeks later, Mr. McCandless turned around and sold it to a man by the name of William Armstrong. William Armstrong, when he bought it, he put a wooden fence around it, separating it from the rest of the cemetery. Now, some of the people who owned the plots in the cemetery said, that's not right, you can't be selling off the cemetery. So, a gentleman by the name of Thomas Westerman, who also happened to be mayor of Oakmont, filed a lawsuit against the cemetery on behalf of the uh, plot owners because he said that um, they should know that the land could not be used for anything other than burials. So this lawsuit ensued, and as part of the lawsuit, they had to perform an audit on the cemetery's finances. It was revealed that Mr. Anderson had been paid $5,821. Now this was $2,821 over the agreed amount of $3,000. So even though uh, he received his $3,000, the money kept coming into him. Now right away, you know, we think in terms of today, corruption and everything, but the thing you have to take into consideration is um, Mr. Anderson did pay the upkeep for the cemetery, he paid for the caretaker. So it's likely that most of that money that he made in excess went right back into the cemetery. Well, it went to court, and on July 20th, 1906, Judge J. Young of the Court of Common Pleas uh, ruled in the case of Westerman versus the Verona Cemetery. He said that William Anderson, Jr. and Margaret Dobbs, the children of William and Solyndra, 
must pay the Verona Cemetery the monies received from the Tom McCa from Tom McCandless from the sale of the cemetery. He said that William Armstrong, who now owned the plot of ground, was permitted to sell, but he had to break it up and sell it as cemetery plots. He was also required to remove the fence that was erected. He also said that William Anderson Sr., even though he spent that money on the cemetery, had to pay the, the, uh, all monies in excess of the original $3,000 back to the Verona Cemetery. The judge said that all parties involved should have known that that was a burial ground and, and they should have known better than to sell it off. So as a result, um, no development took, took place on there and they were, were able to retain it as a cemetery. And I don't know what the children were thinking, you know, that they could get away with selling that, but they tried to. Um, this is an early map from 1907 of Oakmont. And unfortunately, our screen, we can't get it to straighten out this evening. But here you can see, um, you know, the original cemetery was just that straight uh, plot of ground. By 1907, you can see that it, it had expanded over onto Pennsylvania Avenue and had greatly increased in size. Now, I have to tell you, you talk about uh, breaking news. Right before I was ready to start, uh, Cheryl Zentgraff, handed me this map and she had done some research for us down at the uh, county building. She checked all the deeds and all the transfers that have to do with the, the cemetery up there and she mapped out all of the purchases and when they took place and who they purchased it from. It's really uh, excellent information. Thank you, Cheryl. This is great. And I, I just wish I had time to get it up on the screen for you. But it documents all the sale and the progression of the expansion of the cemetery from 1908 up through 1963 is when they made their final purchase to expand the cemetery. But again, you can see that by 1907 it had expanded. Uh, this is 1915 and it's pretty much the same. They had acquired a little bit more land and I know that's not a good picture. Another story about the house in the cemetery. The house now is at 1109 uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. I've had a few different people tell me that that house was actually located across the street in the cemetery and when the cemetery bought that property they picked up the house and moved it across the street. Patty. They did, okay, okay. Yeah, because I, I looked for it on those old plot maps and I couldn't find it in the cemetery, but yet I couldn't find it on the other side of the street. So, you know, it didn't show up anywhere. But um, uh, again, Cheryl found some records down there that where it is located now, that lot was purchased in 1904, and the house was supposedly there in 1905. So does that match that time frame, the 1904? Yeah, okay. So yeah, that, that's the story with that house. Uh, they said that it was located in what they called the first cut section of the cemetery. And I was up there with Carolyn and you know, she took me over. She's the, uh, in, in charge of the cemetery up there and she showed, this is where it was. She, you know, she showed me exactly where it was. So uh, they did have to move that house out of there. The first burial was October 10th, 1880. It was before the cemetery was incorporated. At that point, uh, Mrs. Anderson had, be, had started to sell off plots. Uh, this is Joseph Henge. Again, he died October 10th, 1880, and he is buried uh, right near the circle. He, he was an early uh, burial, and he got one of the prime spots there. So that's, that's the first person officially buried in the cemetery. Uh, this is Solyndra and her husband, William, they're both buried in that same section. Now, a lot of cemeteries have uh, big monuments and, and mausoleums, but the Verona Cemetery, I guess you could call a very modest cemetery. There's really nothing that's, uh, you know, big and massive in that cemetery. But there are a lot of interesting grave sites and monuments in there. 
This one I thought was interesting. This is the Parsons family. And what's interesting is there's one monument in the center, and then you see these headstones here. The family is buried all around this central monument. This one here, I, I don't know, I, I, it's sort of sad. This is uh, Louise Lonchar. Uh, she was 13 years old when she died. And this is located up against the fence on the 10th Street side over near Maryland Avenue. You can hardly see it. I mean, you can see in the back here, there's the, the people's yard there. But what's interesting, it's this little stone in, with glass, and inside the glass are some artificial flowers. And it looks like this part had been um, replaced, but it's all by itself over there in the corner. And it's, uh... This is another one. This is the Phillips Br Brenner family. And again, there are five people buried under, for some reason, this large concrete slab. Samuel Riddle, Riddle, Riddle just has this large sphere on the top of his headstone. This is a gentleman by the name of Jack Loser who died in 1938. What's interesting is his picture is still there. And it's well preserved too. It must be ceramic or something. But also, I thought it was interesting, he has two flower pots right there on his gravestone. This Frank Edinger died in 1924. Here's his headstone. And just for some reason, there's a flower pot next to it, and it says Edinger. So I don't know why they did that, maybe just to put fire, flowers on it every year for Decoration Day. This stone here, last meeting, at the end of the meeting, a lady came up to me. Was that you? Okay. <laughs> and said, did you see the tree trunk? And I said, no. And so I went in search of it. This is Walter Bullinger, who died at the age of 20. And this is a tree. This is the back of it. It looks like a tree stump and in the front of it. And his sister designed it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. But that's, that's an interesting one, too. Another one is Glenn Monks. You may have heard of Glenn Monks. Glenn Monks grew up in Oakmont on 9th Street, graduated from Oakmont High School in 1940. He always wanted to be a pilot. And um, after graduation, he went to Canada and joined the Royal Canadian Air Force because at that time America hadn't entered the war yet and he wanted to be a fighter pilot so he went to Canada and joined their Air Force. Um, he received his wings on February 4th, 1943. He immediately returned to Oakmont, married his sweetheart. In 1943, he was killed in a plane crash. Uh, his body was brought back to Oakmont where he was buried. Uh, this is his stone. And every year on Canadian Memorial Day, the Canadian government sends an Air Force flag down to be put on his stone. This one I thought was sort of funny. It's just Harley J. Smith. It doesn't say anything about him, when he was born, when he was died, but Harley J. Smith is buried there. I don't know who he is, but... <laughs> there are two children's section in the uh, cemetery. At the turn of the century, childhood deaths were very common. You know, today it's, it's still tragic, but it's a rare occurrence. But back then, it was very common. So as a result... They set aside a section of the cemetery for a children's section. And this is located right in the cemetery. I'm standing on one of the, the lower road looking up towards 10th Street. And all these are smaller headstones. If you go up there, you can see, you know, they're a lot smaller than the regular headstones. I counted 96 children buried in that section. I don't know that. Yeah, I would, there's no records as far as race of people buried there. Yes. Now that lower corner, Pennsylvania and 12th. Yeah. There are a lot of right. Houses. Right. Right. Yeah, Where, I don't know that it's segregated. That's what I meant. Which one? Pennsylvania and 12th. Pennsylvania. Okay. Okay. I I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a, just an example of a, a child gravestone. You can see how ornamental they are. And then other ones like this are just simply marked with a, a, 
a cement peg, ceramic peg with a number on it. And that's all the uh, markings that they have. A lot of these children died during the influenza epidemic of 1918. And I talked to Jackie at the cemetery office and I said, could you run me uh, any idea of the, how many people died during that influenza epidemic? And she ran the numbers. In 1970, 1917, there were 64 people buried in the cemetery. 1918, it jumped to 103. And then 1919, it went back down to 49. So that was an indication of a lot of those people died at the influenza epidemic. Now, my grandfather told the story. His grandfather was a sexton at the cemetery during the influenza epidemic. And um, he said that at one point it got so bad that his grandfather, they were digging graves at night because so many people were dying. They had to get them buried. But the funny part of it is he said his cousins would go up and they would hide in the freshly dug graves and scare their grandpa whenever he was digging the graves. <laughs> That's how we... Uh... Now, is there a record of all the kids buried there? Well, some of them are. You know, they, a lot of times uh, it's just what they wrote down back then. You know, 100 years ago they might just put infant. Uh, no information on the age of the child. And then others would write it all out. So, you know, we do have some information. So, you know, we, we have that. And then over in that corner, this would be on 12th Street over on the Maryland Avenue where those houses begin. The houses begin here. There's another children's section in here. And this one seems to date back to the early 50s. That's when I found uh, a lot of those stones. And in that one, I found 39 children. So you figure the, uh, the, the ones up there, this. Plus, there aren't even records of how many children are buried in the family plots. So it's really sobering when you stop and think of how many children are buried in that cemetery. Yes? Now that one is almost on 12th Street. Right, right. The house Okay, yeah, yeah, this is their yard here. But, um, yeah, this is where, this is in here. So it, it is, you know, very sobering when you think about how many children are buried there. Servicemen and women. Uh, women. I tried to get a count on that. Uh, the best we could do, uh, they think there's probably about 350 servicemen and women buried in the cemetery. Uh, dating back to the Civil War, and every war since then, plus those who served in peacetime. So there are a lot of uh, uh, service people. And I, I think you really get the effect of it if you go up there now for Veterans Day or Memorial Day and you just see all the American flags on the grave of those, those soldiers. You know, it really is moving that that many people from our little town served in the uh, services. Uh, this here is hard to see. Uh, I found this in the advanced leader from 1936, and this is a, um, the Verona Cemetery uh, Veterans Burials. And this, as of 1936, this would be before World War II, there were 95 of them buried in there at that time. And they listed their rank and what war they served in and where they're buried. So I thought that was interesting that they had put that in the advanced leader uh, prior to one Memorial Day. There are some monuments in the park. Uh, this one is a Civil War artillery gun that was donated by the, uh, the uh, Charles Bright Post uh, 360 GAR. They presented this to the cemetery in the late 1800s. The other one is what they call the Boy in Blue. This is the large cemetery in the circle at the cemetery. Um, this was sculpted by an Oakmont resident by the name of Louis Vergobi. And I think that's what makes it really unique. Um, it was designed and sculpted by an Oakmont resident. And it's really a nice piece of, of work of art. Um, it was dedicated at the Memorial Day service in 1915. Did they say what that, they got for that? 
Well, the residents of Oakmont raised three thousand dollars to pay for it. It was, a lot of money then. it was a lot of money then. So, I don't know what he made from it or if that was for materials. Um, it was, as I said, it was dedicated at the Memorial Day service in 1915. Uh, there were 24 Civil War veterans on hand for the dedication. I just thought this was, well, and this is a picture of the dedication from 1915. It's in one of your books, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that picture is very popular. It's floating around everywhere. But you can see the, the vets here in the first row here from the Civil War. Uh, they're there for that. But I like this picture here. Here's Mr. Vergobi, and here's the statue. He's buried, buried right by it up in the cemetery. Well, Oakmont Cemetery, or Verona Cemetery, um, has experienced a problem. It was landlocked. Um, it acquired all the land that it could, um, and it was also locked in by the streets. You know, it couldn't really expand. So this year, uh, this new mausoleum was completed. And with this new mausoleum, it has increased the capacity for another 1,026 burials that they'll be able, between cremations and crypts and niches that they have, they'll be able to accommodate 1,000 people in there. So uh, the future looks bright for the cemetery because it's going to be able to uh, continue into the future. I think too often cemeteries get a bad rap. You know, we think of them as scary places, sad places, depressing places, and we don't always feel comfortable going there. But a cemetery tells the story of a community, the people who lived here, who died young, who died old, who died in a war, who died in an epidemic family and friends, all part of our community, all can be found in the cemetery. I recommend the next time you're taking a walk, take a walk through the cemetery. Take time to explore the monuments. Stop and look at this statue sculpted by Oakmont resident uh, Mr. Vergobi. Take in all the American flags on the grave of our veterans. Look at the names throughout the cemetery, Halton, Bright, Lee, Greenwood, Westerman, all those people who played such an important part in the formation of our community are there. Um, anyone with an interest in Oakmont history knows these names, and there they are, still a part of our community. And so it shouldn't be a sad place, but it should be a place where we just preserve and remember the history of our town. So. Um, Next time you're walking up that way, just take a detour through there and take time and um, look at the cemetery. Now, when I was up there taking pictures, I took this picture. And after I got home, I looked at it and I thought, I guess that sums it up. <laughs> One way. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody have any questions or comments? Rob. Some people may know, others may be interested that John Paul Brittenstein, Oakmont High School class of 1966, the only Oakmont resident killed in the Vietnam War, is buried. He's on the Maryland Avenue side of the mausoleum, the 10th Street, Maryland corner, about nine graves down. If you're interested, pay your respects to John Brittenstein. Oh, yeah. We love and appreciate all their service, but uh, some of my generation were somewhat closer to John. So. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, I'm the corporal of the bishop downtown of Trinity in the cemetery trying to get the stones fixed in our horn park. And in the process, I discovered it was a children's grave. A lot of times the parishioners would buy the grave site and then have the infants to Right, right. Yeah, like you say, infants that died at childbirth, and yeah, yeah. 
if they had a plot up there, they would go, and that was it. Yeah. They're not treated too much better today either. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Is there a cap on the number of people buried? Um, I'm sure they have records down there, but I don't. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what the exact count is. Yes. Is there a website where one can locate small uh, cemeteries in Southwest Pennsylvania? I don't know that. I, I'm not sure. There's uh, Norm Minert. Norm Norm Min There's a gentleman by the name of Norm Minert, yeah. and he has what all the cemeteries. Yeah. No, he, they're, they're not complete records, but they're pretty. Yeah, what people send in. I knew. I didn't know if that was still in operation. Yeah. Is it Allegheny Gen Webs or something? Uh, it's Allegheny Gen Webs, and I think it's Allegheny Valley. Uh, okay. But yeah. If you type in Norm Minert. Norm Minor, M-E-I-N-E-R-T. If you Google that, I think you'll find it. Yeah, Cheryl. There's a lot of great sites that have done the history on them and have taken images where you can find over on Ryan on Connors Road. There's a lot of Yeah, yeah. But also the Lake Mont Genealogical Group has a book upstairs that they have done an inventory a while back. And if you go online now to the Rome Cemetery at Oakmont, you can find an up-to-date list. Oh, okay. Yes. I've never checked out the Verona Cemetery, but I know online you can find quite a bit of information. Uh, the Allegheny Cemetery down in uh, Barnesville, they have a, a very big bisection, Blue Fairy mm -hmm. section, St. Mary's out in Lenshaw, out on uh, Middle Road, Pine Street. Uh, half my family's buried out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Most of them are well documented. I mean, some of the older ones, you know, like the Bright Cemetery, over fam you know, we don't have those, but these cemeteries are well documented. You know, you just have to search for it and find it. Yeah. Dan. Where? Uh, no, no. The Bright Cemetery. Oh, well, up here, it's every day. They're still burying there. Bright Cemetery. Uh, they finished that off probably around, I think the last is about 1870 was the last burial at Bright Cemetery. There's no more room there? or Bright Cemetery. Again, they don't know where the graves are. You know, there's some, there are a few stones, but a lot of them have fallen down. And, you know, it's just, I mean, at one point, that roadway that shoots down along the side there, uh, there were bones starting to come out of there. And was it... Dan, you did you you built that wall, correct? My son. His son built a railroad tie wall yeah, to know. secure that hillside because um, so there's bodies all through that, even though there's uh, not marked. Yeah. yeah. Terry. No, no, I didn't get any costs. No, no. Are there any buried available still? Buried sites available? At Verona. I think it's one of those things now where a family may have an extra one or two that, you know, you can get them that way if you know, like, you know, anywhere in Oakmont, if you know somebody, you can get something. And I think that's primarily, you know, how you can buy them now. So, yeah. There is a list. It was lost for a while when Mr. Levitch died. Yeah. And there's a list of buried sites yeah I, but usually it's just one yeah lost. yeah yeah hey, Gary, I'm Jackie. hi Jackie <laughs> So are the people allowed to sell them, though, if they want? Yeah, the people who buy the That's what I, okay. Right, okay, got it, got it. Okay, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, those things are still in that those stone there, if you walk up. Well, you know what, one just came in, as a matter of fact. 
Um, it, the Presbyterian Church here in, in um, Oakmont celebrated their 50th anniversary in 1901. And they had a program printed up, and there's a small picture of the church when it was down here. And you can see the iron fence coming up that alleyway. So it, that's the original iron fence that came up around there and then on up over the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I heard in years it fell down, got knocked down, whatever, yeah, yeah. But that's the only picture I've seen with the fence, yeah. And I was going to try to put it on here, but it was so small that when I enlarged it, you couldn't see the detail of it. Yeah. Dan. <laughs> we, we were banned from, uh, but I, I was digging with one of my mother's uh, good silver spoons, and I lost it, and I got beat it. Yeah. <laughs> Many people that were related to way back mm -hmm. Civil War people. Uh, that's just interesting. Yeah, oh yeah. There's so much history there. You go start looking. Right there, and we were lowering that casket, and and I think it was the first suit I owned. And when I bent over to lower it down, it, it split right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess since we have a cemetery, I'll, I'll tell you one ghost story. This is the only ghost story I can tell you about the cemeteries. Um, about 10 years ago, you may remember, here at the library, we did the mystery tours of Oakmont. We did the, the walk around Oakmont. And what we did, you got a tour guide, and then you had people stationed around, and we told scary stories, mystery stories. Now, the stipulation was it had to be based on a true story. We just didn't make things up, but sure, we, we did. We had a good time doing it, but it was all based on true stories. So we would take a story, and then we would tweak it a little bit and, to make it scary. So one of the stories we did, we came by the uh, Bright Cemetery, and we took the story of Adam Bright, who was buried in Andersonville Prison, and how they tried to get him back, and they couldn't. So we changed it, and we said he wasn't able to come back, but... It's said that on foggy nights, you can see a Civil War veteran wandering through the cemetery and that it's Adam Bright trying to get home. You know, so. so I was, you know how you poke around on the internet, and I found this website that said the 50 scariest places of Western Pennsylvania. And so I looked and it said Bright Cemetery. <laughs> and there was my story. <laughs> And I said, well, now I know how ghost stories get started. It was total fabrication made up by me, and now it's, now it's legend, I guess. Somebody, so, somebody, with you put, that somebody put it on there. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Christopher Haymaker, yeah. Yeah, he was uh, buried... Uh, he was an Indian fighter, and um, he, he killed a lot of Indians back in the 1700s. And the Indians finally caught up with him. This is the story. On the banks of Plum Creek here in Verona, and they killed him. And uh, to ensure that um, he wouldn't chase anyone in the afterlife, they cut off his legs below his knees and, and buried him. 
And um, that was a story that was floating around. Uh, I found another story, uh, the Haymaker family history actually talked about, he was buried down in Verona, there was a burial ground down there uh, on West Railroad Avenue. And when they built a train station, they wanted to build the train station where the cemetery was. So they notified, this was in the 1870s, about 100 years later, they notified the families, if you have anybody buried in that cemetery, come and remove the remains or we will remove them, remove them and um, dispose of the body. So his would be his great-grandchildren went down to move his body and they moved his body out, if you know where the Laird Cemetery is, out in Boyce Park there by the um, uh, basketball courts, they yeah. moved his remains out there. But they said that when they opened his grave, his bones were missing below his knees. And they always thought it was just a, a, a story made up, but that was really was true. It was a ghost story. So. But then again, we changed it that he was still going up and down Plum Creek <laughs> looking for, for Indians. So, <laughs> but, uh, Yes. Our daughter has worked for civil engineers doing drawings, and she had a list on her wall when she was doing building or a road Mm -hmm. And then second was a school, and do you remember some of the wetlands? Yeah, she didn't do wetlands. Don't go through there. Mm -hmm. And once she was doing drawings, and she said, I can't put the road through there. That's how the Cowards down in Braddock. Mm -hmm. They said, Diane, put it through Talbot Cowards. Oh, Braddock's Field, yeah. And Talbot Cowards came down. Yeah. She also did one other thing. They were doing the first street garage down. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. You remember what that name and number was on that note? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got it. Got it right here. What mystery for you? Are going to redo that? I don't know. That'd be pretty easy. Yeah, we. Um, we did it one other, we did it twice, and then we, we had, yeah, I got it here, we're good. Okay. We tried to do it again, but, you know, we couldn't come up with different stories, you know, and we didn't want to just make